Hello everyone, this is Sarah from Hamilton. In this video, Michael Garten will survey evidence from authors prior to the Council of Nicaea, which refute Gavin Ortland's contention that the creation and veneration of iconography was an innovation of the 6th to the 8th centuries, lacking authentic basis in the tradition of the Church. Many of these sources are not widely known or discussed, and we are both looking forward to bringing them into this conversation and continuing our detailed engagement and interacting with Dr. Ortland's work on this subject. We ask that our audience, of all perspectives, Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant, listen with an open mind and especially treat all parties involved in this discussion with respect and Christian charity, keeping your speech seasoned with salt. We appreciate Dr. Ortland's challenge and engagement, and we look forward to more directly interacting with him in the future. If you would like to support this work, please consider signing up for Michael's Substack, which is linked in the pinned comment. Michael will continue to develop his arguments in this video and future videos on that subject, Substack, including in a number of exclusive posts. If you are interested in a detailed scriptural interaction with Protestant criticisms of Orthodox and Catholic theology, please consider purchasing my 17-hour set of lectures answering Protestantism from the Bible, again linked in the pinned comment. Finally, if you are interested in supporting this channel on a regular basis in whatever capacity, please consider becoming a patron or YouTube member. Thanks to everyone who's watching, and please enjoy. Yeah, thanks, Seraphim. And uh, I do want to say I'm I'm excited to dive into some more. Um, in addition to the the framework that you've provided, which I think is definitely something that needs to be seriously contended with by anyone who wants to say that iconography is not permitted and even suggested or uh, so implicitly required by uh, the scriptures. In addition to that, I'm excited in future videos to go into more like specific cases. Uh, of times in the scriptures where it looks like we have image veneration going on mm -hmm. of various kinds and uh, and how that would also link up to uh, the practice of of the church across time yeah. um all right so uh so now this uh presentation is deliberately titled icon veneration is clearly not an accretion uh specifically because dr ortland's claim was that it is um, and obviously the this alone will make you protestant is perhaps like a little bit of a joke or something like that but the claim of uh clarity about it being an accretion uh it i think it deserves a uh, serious consideration and a serious answer um i view his take on the early church as summarized in the following four claims or theses the first is that images existed in the early church before 325 a.d but they were used for decorative and teaching purposes or at least, to use Dr. Ortland's um, terminology here, at least you would need to argue for the conclusion that they had another use if you were going to make that claim. Uh, the second claim is that a plentitude of pre-325 AD Christian writers who speak about images denounce their cultic use, their use in any kind of a religious context, uh, and especially with respect to expressing devotion towards them in any way uh, of any kind of devotion. Um, and he claims that this is not just a denunciation of idols, but covers all image veneration practices. Idolatry being um, something that maybe even doesn't even deserve to be called image veneration per se, just because that's it's confusing to put those in the same category. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, Ortland's position is what the what the pre Nicene um, Christian writers are talking about would entail a rejection of uh modern orthodox practice modern catholic practice of image veneration as well um <clears throat> he uh seems to either imply or state that there are no known instances of mainstream christian authors attesting to the church having a practice of image veneration um <clears throat> some of his language is suggestive of of this like kind of blanket claim uh, that there are zero instances. It's possible that he would want to nuance this slightly and say, oh, it wasn't common or the bulk of the evidence is against it or most people spoke against it. But, um, you know, feel free to, you know, look at his videos for clarification about exactly what his position is there. But he certainly thinks that 
the vast majority um, of early Christian authors who speak about images would be decidedly against it, and that there and that there's not really any uh, strong or clear case to be made for icon veneration uh, from the pre-Nicene Church. And his fourth claim um, is that the scholarly consensus affirms these three points, or leans in this direction, or tends to affirm these three claims. Um, that art could be for teaching and decoration, but that we don't have you know much reason or decisive reason or good reason to see it as uh, having been venerated. Secondly, that early authors all oppose cultic use of images. And um, thirdly, that there's basically no positive or very few positive or marginal affirmations of cultic use of images. All right. So to summarize the kind of evidence that he brings forward for these claims, one of the things that he states is that pre-325 AD Christian authors uh, reported, or sorry, one of the one of the categories of evidence that he brings forward is uh, pre-325 Christian authors reporting pagan complaints about their lack of use of images um, and lack of veneration thereof. Another is um, another category of evidence that he uses is pre-325 AD Christian authors denouncing images or arguing for their inferiority. Um, and uh, a third category is pre-325 AD Christian authors denouncing cultic practices in relation to images such as bowing, uh, although there are other uh, categories there of veneration practices that uh, that you could mention. Um, he draws attention to uh, you know denial denial of crowning uh, of images, I believe, um, and lighting candles in front of them. Um, but certainly he draws attention to the, you know, what appears to be a rejection of any kind of bowing towards images. And then fourthly, um, he argues for his claims by mentioning uh, evidence from modern scholars stating that there was no iconodulia until long after 325 AD. Um, and again, uh, it's possible that he would, you know, nuance precisely uh, what he means here and, and maybe say something like a little bit more careful, like, you know, uh, significant consensus of modern scholars. Um, it's possible that he would say uh, marginal or no cases of iconodulia. But uh, basically, he's he's claiming and providing um, uh, at least putative evidence for the claim that um, that modern scholars are stating there was no iconodulia. And I think one of the things that. Um that he does emphasize in the video is that he's using universal language very intentionally. I mean, that's a point that he makes, that he doesn't want to use universal or absolute language where it's just hyperbolous. And so the impression that um, I think he seems to be giving or that he intends to give, and I have no reason to think that he's being intentionally dishonest here, but the impression he seems to be giving is that there are really only two positions in the academic literature on this, one of which says that it began around the 6th seventh or the sixth century, and the other uh, suggests that it uh, really took root in the uh, 7th and 8th century. So it doesn't seem that he leaves much room for nuance on that particular point. That That's true. I... Um... Yes, that, I, I understand what you're saying. There's definitely language that's suggestive of of those kind of universal uh, claims, and uh, that he would he would concur with those scholars, and that he views them as basically constituting a consensus position. Um, I, of course, would would be uh, I, I entirely understand the idea of allowing someone to clarify their position in response to um, requests for clarification, but I agree that it has been a um, a frequent theme in his video responses to people who are defending or arguing for iconodulia that he'll reiterate um uh very universal sounding uh language about this um okay so there's certain responses to ortland's case that i consider to be problematic and it's a case that's echoed um in uh Certain other uh, Protestant theologians, uh, David Berceau, um, the Restorationist uh, Protestant theologian comes to mind, and uh, there's a handful of others who uh, make a similar case based on the early church. Um, there's a number of problematic responses. Uh, one is that the change in attitude towards images is just a typical development of doctrine. 
Um, this has been uh, a theme in some of the responses. And the problem with this is that um, if Dr. Orland is correct, then what we're dealing with here is a complete doctrinal U-turn, going from a very firm consensus position among early Christian authors, um, including a number of saints, which says, according to Dr. Orland's interpretation, um, no veneration of images is ever permitted for any reason of any kind. Um, and then a shift as you leave the, the uh, pre-Nicene era um, and an increasing sort of uh, progression of greater and greater degrees of consensus about the legitimacy of devotional practices using images involving the veneration of them. Uh, as you get closer and closer to uh, Second Nicaea, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which of course affirms uh, the legitimacy of venerating images of Christ and the saints, and also um, uh, makes that part of what it means to be a Christian in practice. Um, and so uh, this does constitute the the basis for um, his internal critique. Um, where uh, Orthodox are claiming to be um, the early church in continuity um, and to retain the practices, the heart of the practices of the early church and her mindset. Um, and at the same time, we're apparently claiming uh, that image generation is good and necessary when that early church, according to Dr. Orland and some other people, uh, speaks expressly against image veneration uh, in no uncertain terms in a universal or nearly universal voice. Um, and a, a further a further issue with this is so even even if one grants um, that, for instance, in Catholicism there's a kind of doctrinal development that can occur, um, for Orthodox, um, first of all, we are suspicious of any idea of development as a complete U-turn. That sounds, um, that sounds uh, su fairly suspect, uh, going from there being basically not even a seed to a full tree. Uh, that seems to be like a, a, significant, uh, a significant problem. Um, but we, as Orthodox, either reject or greatly nuance what's meant by development. Again, of course, depending on what's meant by development of doctrine. Uh, and so that route isn't even really open to us. And I think uh -huh. maybe one thing to add yeah. here, just about um, the notion of doctrinal development, is that it seems to me that John Henry Newman's idea of doctrinal development um, really can't be identified with, for example, what Pope Pius X means by uh, doctrinal development, I think, in uh, I think it might be the syllabus of errors, or I think maybe I'm thinking of a different encyclical. But Pius X uh, contrasts the notion of development with the notion of doctrinal, you know, evolution. And I think you know there are sources in the early church, like Saint Vincent of Lerins, and then modern Orthodox theologians like Florovsky and Stanilo, who'll talk about some idea of development. But there are very explicitly delineated boundaries about what development entails. You know, this can't be a kind of doctrinal or historical Orwellianism where, you know, we just redefine it to mean whatever we need it to mean. Uh, there needs to be some kind of visible um, expression of the fact that there is a continuity here and that continuity is the major note here. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Another problematic response that I've seen is um, basically claims that there's just simply an absence of evidence on this. We don't have enough written and material evidence to make a judgment. Um, now, on, a, on the face of it, I don't think there's necessarily anything problematic about saying that uh, if there really is not much evidence uh, one way or another about something. Um, but at least the putative evidence that's being put forward um, all appears to go in one direction. So we seem to have quite a bit of evidence, uh, and it all appears to go in one direction. Uh, a third problematic response is the early denunciation of images is aimed at idolatry. Now, I actually think this is true. The problem is that it needs to be shown. Um, some of the responses that I've seen uh, come out on the internet, uh, YouTube, blogs, and so forth, has 
um, succeeded in, in, you know, drawing attention to the fact that denunciation of images uh, in anti-Nicene sources is clearly linked to idolatry, but it needs to be developed more. And why it is that, it needs to also be explained why it is that denunciation of idolatry wouldn't necessarily entail denunciation of image veneration. Um, and so that's something that uh, I I hope to get into in these in these future videos. Um, but leaving aside these problematic responses, what I want to put forward is a different kind of response to the challenge, uh, a response which actually is to offer uh, numerous strands of positive evidence from the early church uh, that show the veneration of icons was actually. Uh, a common practice in early Christianity before the Council of Nicaea. So my four theses about the pre-Nicene church and icons are as follows. The first is that several kinds of images we have from the pre-325 AD church were very likely to have been used cultically and venerated. The second thesis is that the early authors who attack cultic practices are specifically targeting idolatry. The attacks often target cultic practices which clearly state or suppose that pagan idols are in question. Some quotes are unclear in their wording, but cultural context suggests idols are in view. And this is the important thing. It cannot be assumed that things they say about idols would apply to icons. The third thesis is that several mainstream Christian authors attest to the church having practices of image veneration. And then fourthly, the scholarly consensus is actually divided, and increasing numbers of scholars accept one or more of the following claims. A, pre-325 AD attacks on images are precisely, precisely targeting idolatry, as opposed to image veneration in general. B, there was some cultic use of images. C, there was some image veneration. D, we cannot rule out that the images we have from pre-325 AD were venerated. That's like a weaker version of claim C um, that you see various scholars such as Robin Jensen grant. They just ask a question and you can you can punt on this if you want to just get yeah, into yeah. it later in your presentation or in future videos. Um, but I think uh, so, some people might say about the patristic in the Antinocene period critique of idolatry that, okay, you know, their target is pagan idolatry, but that the logic they use to target pagan idolatry or the terms in which they critique pagan idolatry are logic in terms which, by the nature of the case, would exclude them from venerating icons, right? So if they're saying you can't, um, it's ridiculous that you're worshiping idols because you can't worship God through something visible, right? Their target would be pagan, but that would seem to exclude by implication that they are using visible representations of God in a Christian liturgy. What, what would you say to that? So some of the authors which appear to be making claims like that actually venerate images. Uh, so that's part, that's the first response. And I will get into that in this video and develop it more in, in later ones. The second one is that uh, in many cases, the logic used for um, uh, rejection of idolatry is very clearly uh, indexed to idolatry and the specific ritual practices related to idolatry itself um, in a way that does make it very suspect to say that it would apply to icons, which definitely are not anything like idols. <laughs> and that would be a that would be a worthwhile uh, thing to dig into and explore in and of itself. Um, so I, I think that those those two considerations on their own are um uh, should handle most or all of those um, those cases that Dr. Ortland brings up. Um, and so, yes, um, getting into the question about the relationship between uh, divine invisibility and legitimacy of of image making, um, I also want to I, I do want to kind of suspend that for um, a later video, but. The response would be along the lines that I that I just um, mentioned. Obviously, much need to go into more detail about uh, why specifically I think that's a legitimate move to make, though. Sure. Okay. okay. So, uh, so for the purposes here today, I'm just going to 
focus on giving uh, a summary of the evidence for one and three. So first of all, several kinds of images we have from the pre-325 AD church were very likely to have been used cultically and venerated. And then three, several mainstream Christian authors attest to the church having practices of image veneration. A couple clarifications before getting into this any further. Uh, for one thing, I'm not going to assume kind of like the inerrancy of the church fathers or something, but I am going to assume that Christianity is true, the Bible is inerrant, and uh, I'm going to take a robust view of early Christian history. In other words, I'm not necessarily interested in getting into um, someone who wanted to be skeptical about whether Tertullian wrote uh, on modesty, for instance. Um, that's just not really the, the focus here. So I'm assuming uh, that basically the sources we have are fairly reliable and uh, reflect the state of things on the ground in the early church, as opposed to taking kind of like a um, a view, a more like cynical view of early Christian writings. Uh, the second clarification I want to give is that I will be incorporating uh, in it evidence for the veneration of the cross in the pre-325 AD church. And this is relevant for three reasons. The first is that, well, crosses are images. <laughs> uh, they're images of the true cross. So I actually think that this is evidence for image veneration, um, just in a straightforward way. The fact that the later uh, Council of Hyatira would kind of draw a distinction between uh, crosses and icons doesn't um, doesn't actually seem relevant to the question of whether or not the early church venerated something that was a visual representation of something else. Um, the second reason for uh, including this is because Protestants who are looking for what early Christians practiced will care about this uh, since it conflicts with the practice of not venerating crosses. And then the third reason is um, this does affect how we interpret the denunciation of rituals involving images in early Christian writers. So if you have an early Christian author who attests to veneration of the cross, but also says, we don't venerate images, images cannot show us God, so on and so forth, you know that they must mean something more specific by the word image. They can't just mean all visual representations. They have to be talking about idols. Some additional clarifications before jumping into the evidence itself. Um, it's important to not anachronize and to not assume that the evidence for the veneration of images that we would see in the pre-Nicene church would look exactly like um, current Orthodox practice or sort of middle Byzantine era icon veneration practices. We can't assume also that the only kinds of images uh, that would be venerated in the pre-Nicene church would be those that are like typical in the Orthodox church after 325 AD, such as portrait icons, which are kind of our most common go-to, and then various kinds of wall art that can also be venerated in certain ways. Um, these uh, were not, I'm going to decisively say that there are other kinds of admissible evidence. There are other kinds of images that Christians have used. Um, and furthermore, that there are other kinds of veneration besides bowing and kissing. Um, so here are a number of, of kinds, um, and we see these in the pre-Nicene church. Crowning, so the placement of crown, of a crown, laurels, or so on and so forth, etc., around or on an image. B, lamp lighting and candle lighting in front of or towards an image. C, exaltation, placing something high up in a central place of attention. D, procession, using images as frontal or central in a procession. Images, uh, E, images used to consecrate vessels being acknowledged in order to direct worship to God. That's a mouthful. It will require some clarification, but hang on for when I talk about Tertullian because it'll become much clearer why I'm, why I uh, said that very wordy thing for letter E here. Uh, letter F, concealment. Now, with this, um, you have to stretch your mind a little bit and understand that one of the ways in which honor was shown to holy things in the Old Testament, uh, and that it continues to be shown that in the New Testament in the practice of uh, women wearing veils in church, for instance, is by means of concealment or veiling. 
Um, the Ark of the Covenant was veiled precisely as a way of showing honor to um, the presence of God that hovered over the Ark and showing honor to the Ark itself. Uh, and so if you have reason to believe that um, an image is being concealed precisely for the purpose of honoring it, then there you have an instance of veneration as well. G, adornment. So any kind of sort of uh, decoration given towards the image for the sake of honoring. Um, and H, prayer stances of various kinds, such as the Oran stance or kneeling. I, memorialization. So basically, if something, if an image is a memorial, if it's something that is sort of put up to retain uh, cultural or community memory, and if that image becomes an object of remembrance, focus, and attention to the point even of being visited by people and being uh, kind of protected and preserved um, uh, with much effort and at great lengths, that does constitute a form of honoring of the image. J, uh, unspecified forms of veneration. So basically, some of these references have detail about the kind of veneration in question, while others don't really give detail about the sort of posture or the implements used in the rituals of veneration. So here are the different categories of evidence that I'll be looking into. The first is pre-325 AD Christian author's own attestation. The second category is post-325 AD attestation to pre-325 AD practices. The third category is enemy attestation pre-325 AD. The fourth category is archaeological evidence of the pre-325 AD church. And the fifth category is epigraphical and manuscript evidence pre-325 AD. So starting off with Christian authors' own attestation to their own practices. Uh, I'm going to start with St. Ignatius of Antioch. In this quote um, from his epistle to the Smyrnians, he says the following, I glorify God, even Jesus Christ, who has given you such wisdom, for I have observed that you are perfected in an immovable faith, and if you were nailed, as if you were nailed to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, nailed to the cross for us in his flesh. Of this fruit we are, by his divinely blessed passion, that he might set up a standard for all ages, through his resurrection, to all his holy and faithful followers, whether among Jews or Gentiles, in the one body of his church. So, this quote is interesting for a number of reasons. It's very easy to pass by um, if we are not um, sort of entering into the cultural context in which St. Ignatius, Ignatius of Antioch is speaking. Um, the word standard, that's just not very familiar. It's not very common for us. And it actually might be the fault of the translators. Well, not the fault, but because it's you know sort of older English uh, translation uh, that we miss the fact that he's basically talking about a banner or a flag. Um, now, uh, independently of this quote, there are various forms of honor that St. Ignatius of Antioch describes giving to the cross. And in our in-depth dive videos, I'll go into specific quotes where he expresses this. He talks about sacrificing himself for the cross. He talks about making himself nothing before it, um, sort of lowering himself and turning himself into off-scouring, to use the uh, biblical word that he incorporates. Um, and he talks about loyalty, being afraid of speaking falsehood against it. It's also important to recognize that he views the cross as distinct from Christ's death. So when he says cross, it's not just kind of like a substitute word for the passion of Christ, um, the sufferings of Christ, the death of Christ. They are inseparably connected, but they're not identical in his theology. And I'll get into why uh, that clearly is the case when we do the in-depth dive. The cross here is described as a standard, uh, uh, which... Pardon my lack of knowledge of Greek pronunciation, but I believe this is susamon, uh, and it can also be translated as ensign or banner. All, the, all those basically meaning the same thing. Um, this is deliberately, distinctly military language, and it references the cult of standards in the Roman army, the practice of worshiping Roman military banners, there, um, which I'll get more into how this is related, of course, when we do the deep dive. Um, there's also a connection to the prophet Isaiah. Susamon is used in the Septuagint three times to describe a banner by which God gathers his people and the nations. So here's some examples of 
um, Roman military standards. The one on the left is basically like a modern reconstruction, whereas the one on the right is actually, um, from my understanding, a Roman Aquila standard representing the eagle, which is a representation of Jupiter. Zeus. And let me just, I just want to say this is a really interesting point. I don't know what the word in the Septuagint would be here, but given that you just mentioned the significance of icons as a memorial, it's fascinating to me that you find the language in Exodus 17, the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book, recite it in the ears of Joshua, and then goes on, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner, which is one of the biblical roots of this imagery of, of the God of Israel as banner. So that's an interesting point that perhaps we can pursue in future videos. That is very interesting. Um, yes. And and the, the word in Isaiah, in the Septuagint, that's used those three times is susamon. Uh, it's the exact same word that St. Ignatius uses, um, which is why uh, which is why I believe Lightfoot, the translator of the Apostolic Fathers, um, thought that, that, that St. Ignatius was directly referencing Isaiah. Um, so standards are, of course, inherently objects of veneration. They're honored by being exalted or placed high up, which focuses community loyalty on the ideal represented. The focus uh, and other visible reverence to a standard mirrors the commitment to a person, a nation, a deity, an idea, so on and so forth, represented by it. And given Ignatius's own talk of lowering and sacrificing himself for it, this is public ritual veneration that we are talking about. Um, the devotion or honor given to the standard, the image, passes to the cross of Christ, the prototype. And so here we have exaltation veneration by exaltation, and possibly veneration by bowing as well. All right. My next source is St. Clement of Alexandria. In his well-known passage on Christian use of signet rings, he um, makes a number of statements that are uh, that are relevant and that show um, that, the, that this is not just referring to image use, but to image veneration. So he says, if it is necessary for us while engaged in public business or discharging other avocations in the country and often away from our wives to seal anything for the sake of safety, he, the word, the logos, Christ, allows us a signet, that is to say a signet ring, for this purpose only. Let our seals be either a dove or a fish or a ship scudding before the wind or a musical lyre, which Polacrates used, or a ship's anchor, which Seleucus got engraved as a device. And if there be one fishing... He will remember the apostle and the children drawn out of the water. For we are not to delineate the faces of idols, we who are prohibited to cleave to them, nor a sword, nor a bow, following as we do peace, nor drinking cups being temperate. So this is from his book, uh, I believe it's De Pedagogos, The Instructor, book three. Here are some uh, instances of actual signet rings. On the right, you have a trove of signet rings. Um, dating from 1st through 4th centuries AD, um, present in the London, uh, the British Museum in London. Um, this reflects the practice of theft and collection of signet rings, which points to their value and the degree of honor with which they were held. Um, and I'll get into a, a kind of funny historical incident in which this concern for the power and the honor of signet rings and collecting them in order to like gain that honor um, I'll get into a funny historical incident when we do the deep dive related to this. On the left, you see a good shepherd signet ring dated to the third century AD, according to New Testament scholar and historian Candida Moss. Um, and so there is this, uh, there are actual historical remains that reflect the Christian practice of having um, images of Christ and the kingdom, that is to say, holy images on Christian signet rings. Now, to elaborate a little on what St. Clement of Alexandria is saying, he speaks of the signet rings being for the sake of safety. And part of what's going on here is signet stamping of property or documents to avoid theft or falsification. But there's also an apotropaic side of this that I'll elaborate on. Um, the way in which this particularly relates to veneration is by means of acknowledging the value given to signet rings, which we've already seen in this um, common sort of trope of stealing people's signet rings and hoarding them. Um, but also uh, Pliny the Elder, writing in the first century AD, uh, he's like an associate of the Roman emperors. Uh, he talks about the ways in which signet rings are basically honored by people. He speaks of, for instance, the practice of wearing substitutes. If you have kind of like silver bling on your fingers, then it means you've got gold bling at home. Basically, you kind of show the honor and uh, the reverence for your ring by 
displaying the fat by displaying um you know not quite as fancy stuff on your fingers and it indicates to people it signals to them that you've got something uh even more honorable at home the practice of hiding signet rings uh and then he has this particular phrase he speaks of um the reverent holding of them only to be taken from the coffer the the sort of storage box for the signet ring as from a sanctuary so signet rings were inherently venerated um this holy handling this honor given to the signet image passes to the aspect of christ or his kingdom which is represented the prototype uh, so you have your veneration by means of concealment as with the again the veiling of the holy of holies women's practice of veiling and you also have memorialization and i think the more we reflect on the fact that the secular sacred distinction um of modern days was not present back then and that the house was not just your own property but the property of the god that you've dedicated yourself to in roman times um it starts to make more sense um the kind of importance and the spiritual significance that signet rings would have and why they would be treated with so much honor and so this is this does attest then to a uh, christian practice this when you take the two to considerations together what signet rings were and how they were used and the fact that saint clement of alexandria um describes the making of them you have um a venerated image another example of a pre-nicene writer who attests to image veneration is origin um, and this is particularly interesting because many people hold forth origin as a clear aniconist and someone who denies that images are ever venerated but he um he actually affirms the veneration of at least some kinds of images and so here we have um, a quote from him from his homilies on joshua now to clarify the context of this quote is that <clears throat> he's basically uh going on a little bit of a tirade against um uh, sort of surface level Christians who lack any deep spiritual conviction uh, and lack like a deep spiritual understanding of the outward practices of the church and who basically kind of live semi-immoral lives, but who can kind of show up to church and fake it and who can give the impression of themselves being um, uh, holy people by means of various kinds of veneration that they give to aspects of the church. Um, and he compares them to the Gibeonites from the Old Testament um, in, in Joshua. And he has an extended rant about the Gibeonites and these Christians and how they're basically all the same kind. So he says, nevertheless, the great extent to which we are instructed by semblances of figures of this kind, referring to the Gibeonites in the Old Testament, must be known. Because if there are any such persons among us whose faith is characterized only by this, that they come to church and bow their heads to the priests, exhibit courtesy, honor the servants of God, even bring something for the decoration of the altar or church. Yet they exhibit no inclination to also improve their habits, correct impulses, so on and so forth. Those who are like this, let them know that they will be assigned a part and lot with the Gibeonites by the Lord Jesus. So, Origen is referring to a pious practice of decorating altars and churches and compares coarse Christians who show only outward piety by venerating things to the Gibeonites from the Old Testament. The altar and church he refers to must be literal. They cannot be a metaphor for the soul because he's precisely talking about people who lack an inner altar of the heart. So this is not to say that he denies that there is a kind of an internal meaning to uh, temples, altars, and images that corresponds to something within the soul. He's not here denying that there is an inner aspect to that, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking here about actual physical churches and altars that Christians have. The altar is, of course, an image of God's throne, uh, composed of cherubim, and the church is an image of the heavenly courtroom, and therefore the adornment, the honor given to the altar, image, passes to God's cherubic throne, the prototype. So we have here veneration by means of adornment. Our fourth witness is Tertullian, also often put forward as a little bit iconophobic, and um, a very careful reading of his treatise on modesty uh, reveals an entirely opposite attitude. Uh, it was I believe I was um, listening to something by Jim Papandrea, uh, and he first noted 
that people are misreading Tertullian. As I continued to look into this, it became clear how much of a shocking reversal this is and how clear it is that he's describing an image veneration practice occurring in churches. Um, and while you could attempt to resist the inference that Tertullian himself agrees with this image veneration practice, um, I actually think a strong case can be made that he actually is completely on board with what's happening. Um, but if you were to say that Tertullian isn't attesting to his own practices here, you have still a much, much bigger problem, which is that he's talking about image veneration that's occurring on consecrated Eucharistic cups, which would be used by priests and bishops. Tertullian is not a priest or a bishop. He is a teacher, kind of like a catechist in the early church. So even if you wanted to say that Tertullian didn't agree with this image veneration practice, you would have to deal with the fact that he's actually speaking from a position of relative insignificance compared to um, a fairly widespread practice, it looks like, in North African Christianity of having images on cups and venerating them. So to begin, uh, let the very paintings upon your cups come forward to show whether even in them, the figurative meaning of that sheep will shine through. The outward semblance to teach, whether a Christian or heathen sinner, be the object it aims at in the matter of restoration. Now here, Tertullian is kind of lambasting, um, he's going to be lambasting people that believe there's post-baptismal forgiveness of serious sins. Um, and so he's trying to narrow in on their what he thinks is their misuse of the parable of the lost sheep. Um, Tertullian says the parable of the lost sheep is talking about an unbeliever becoming a believer. Tertullian's opponents, who are not rigorists like he is, they're saying that parable also applies to people who have lost their faith and have turned away from Christ. And Tertullian is saying, if you, if you actually um, are open to the mystagogical meaning of the paintings of the good shepherd that are on your cup, then you will understand that um, then you will understand if you're open to the meaning inherent within the sacrament through the image that's there, you'll understand, no, this is only um, this good shepherd parable uh, or the, the parable of the lost sheep that it's only for the restoration. Uh, it's only for uh, non-Christians being brought into Christianity. Okay. So he continues. But I would yield my ground to you if the scriptures of the shepherd, see again, shepherd of Hermas, um, uh, this is a text which uh, attests to um, belief that there's at least one restoration that you can have after baptism. Um, and Tertullian is going to be attacking it. Uh, but I would yield my ground to you if the scriptures of the shepherd, which is the only one which favors adulterers, had deserved to find a place in the divine canon. If it had not been habitually judged by every council of churches, even of your own, among apocryphal and false writings. So he's saying, you people who use the shepherd of Hermas to try and back up your belief that you can restore the lapsed, you're wrong because everyone acknowledges that it's spurious. It's a crazy fake writing. It's self-adulterous. So he's referring to the shepherd of Hermas book. The book is itself adulterous, adulterous, and hence a patroness of its comrades from which in other respects too, you derive initiation to which perchance that shepherd will play the patron whom you depict upon your sacramental chalice depict, I say, as himself with all a prostitutor of the Christian sacrament and hence worthily both the idol of drunkenness and the brise of adultery by which the chalice will quickly be followed a chalice from which you sip nothing more readily than the flavor of the, the you of your second repentance. I, however, imbibe, the scriptures of that shepherd who cannot be broken. So I'll dive more deeply into all of this language and precisely what it means later. But before we get to looking at some of the points in it, I want to draw attention to the fact that the kind of use of cups that Tertullian is speaking about is not exceptional. Uh, it, ref it reflects a common practice in uh, Greco-Roman culture of having ritual cups that are consecrated for ritual use to a deity by means of the depiction of the deity on the cup. A famous example of this is the Lycurgus cup uh, from the 300s AD, 
and it portrays Bacchus or Dionysius, as the Greeks would call him, the wine god, and a Bacchic ritual story on the cup. Um, and so, when you can, when you take into account the ritual that's being depicted, as well as what we know about Bacchic rituals from writings such as the Bacchae, um, and when you take into account symposium cups and all other sorts of examples of ritual cups that were used uh, in the ancient Mediterranean, um, there's this connection that's made between the image on the cup and the patron of the ritual in which the cup is used. So for Tertullian, uh, the paintings of the Good Shepherd on cups are not objected to. Instead, he actually thinks they can mystagogically reveal the true meaning of the Eucharist. And I'll reiterate and get more into that next time. But if you look at the first thing he says, he basically says, you know, basically be taught by the icon on your cup. Um, secondly, uh, he has this language in, in the quotes that I just gave of patronage, initiation, uh, and connection uh, to the image on the cup. Um, and in doing this, he is connecting two Greco-Roman practices of using consecrated ritual drinking cups, whether it's a Bacchic cup or a symposium cup, that's dedicated to the god imaged on the cup. And so, for Tertullian, the acknowledgement, that is to say honor, given to the consecrated painting, the image, passes to the patron, the prototype. My last um, pre-Nicene uh, Christian author who gives positive attestation to Christian practice about this is St. Methodius of Olympus. And he says the following, the images of our kings here, even though they be not formed of the more precious materials, gold or silver, are honored by all. For men do not slight those less valuable, but honor every image in the world, even though it be chalk or bronze. And one who speaks against either of them is not acquitted as if he had spoken against clay, nor condemned for having despised gold, but for having been disrespectful towards the king and lord himself. The images of God's angels, which are fashioned of gold, the principalities and powers, we make to his honor and glory. And this is from his uh, second discourse on, on the resurrection. So first we have him saying men honor every image in the world. Secondly, he expresses the type prototype principle about honor, so common in St. John of Damascus and preserved in Orthodox practice today in a negative way. So the dishonor given to the image passes to the prototype, echoing what you said earlier, Seraphim, uh, about uh, how this would have worked in the scriptures. Um, and then uh, thirdly, he speaks about images of God's angels. And, and here he uses parallel language. He describes the gold images of kings and the gold images of angels. He describes the king and lord that's imaged uh, in the sort of more common worldwide practice of making royal images. And he describes principalities and powers. Um, he, In speaking about the honor given to angels in this regard, uh, he's reflecting liturgical practice, honoring angels, which uh, I'll uh, corroborate in Saint in a quote in from Saint Justin Martyr's first apology. And so here we have the honor or dishonor given to the image of the angel passes to the angel as prototype. So those are um, the five pre-Christian authors that I'm putting forward as uh, clear cases of proponents and practitioners of image.